Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, this is, uh, which one today? This is Sally. Sally actually eats the same amount as Shackleton. Shackleton's as thin as a rake, gets lots of exercise, and Sally just lies there. So I got a cat leash, and Sally's going to start going on walks outside, So because uh, this is getting a bit ridiculous, but... Uh, Anyway, she's not as uh, videogenic or photogenic as, uh, as, as Shackleton is, but uh, she's relatively calm today. Come on, kitty, kitty, kitty. So last night I sat on my porch in the pouring rain. And, uh, you know, while it was pouring rain, not in the pouring rain, and talked about the biblical flood that will drown California. So I gave lots of details. Um, in 1861... 1862 it basically rained for 45 straight days in the winter starting sometime in November 1861 carrying over through January end of January 1862 tremendous amounts of rain that rain basically filled up the California Valley so cities like Sacramento were 15 feet underwater now Scientists thought this was a one in a thousand year event, but more recently they've done sediment cores in the rivers of California and they've determined that these floods happened periodically. They happened every one to two hundred years as, as determined from the sediment record. In the 1800 years preceding 1861, there were um, six mega floods that were much larger than the 1861 and 62 event and there were three on about equal scale so you know nine nine events that's every couple hundred years now the the the, the main mechanism in a nutshell that is causing this is in the tropics it's hot there's lots of evaporation you get these filaments of water these so-called atmospheric rivers they can be thousands of miles long fairly narrow and carry the flow rate 25 times more, carry 25 times more water, uh, about a mile or 1.6 kilometers high. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, can, they come up to the northeast from the equator and they generally impact <coughs> west coasts of continents. So there's about, uh, you know, five fingers or filaments, if you like, both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere and uh, they produce tr tremendous amounts of rainfall and water so with climate change and of course a greatly warming tropics there's more evaporation for every degree celsius rise in temperature there's seven percent more water vapor in the atmosphere so the, um, these atmospheric rivers are actually loaded with more water than they were before and that's from climate change and it's estimated that the frequency of occurrence of these atmospheric river events on California, causing a mega flood on California, have increased three times. So instead of every 100 to 200 years, it's expected now every 35 to 65 years or so. And we haven't had one since 1861-62. Now, just to give you an idea of the impact flooding the Central Valley of California would do, it's 1% of the agricultural area of the U.S., and, uh, but that's 25% of the food growing capacity of the U.S. So I talked about uh, all of these things in my rant video, and now I'm going to show you some of the uh, specific scientific papers on atmospheric rivers and on this uh, particular event. So I highly recommend that you Google this. It's wired, a Wired article by Tom Philpott, The Biblical Flood That Will Drown California. The Great Flood of 1861 to 62 was a preview of what scientists expect to see again and soon. Okay, so it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and it's expected much sooner than later. So all of the details that are in this article, the main details I discussed um, in my rant video. So take a look at that if you haven't already. That's, a, that's the first video in this series. If you Google, go to Google, Im Google, Google Images, open it up, or select Images up on the top when you're in Google, and look at Topography of California, and here you can clearly see 
the Central Valley of California. So it's about 450 miles long. On average, the width is about 50 miles. It comprises vast region with a temperate climate and fertile soils. So it's perfect for growing. Uh, it's, it's a jewel of America's agricultural system. And these are a bunch of different images you can see. You know, here's a good one with the mountains. So we've got the Sierra Nevada. We've got the coastal mountains here. And, and, and in, this, in this valley, this central valley, it's the, you know, like I say, the jewel of U.S. agriculture. Okay, so <clears throat> Google, or um, you, you may have recognized this image. If you uh, Google Arctic sea ice graphs, actually, of all places, and go to the very bottom, you can see this is total precipitable water and it cycles through over a couple days. And what you can see is, um, so this is, the, uh, this is in millimeters on the left scale, inches here, so high intensity water in the brown, brownish, reddish areas. And what you can see is you can see these fingers or filaments. There's one here, two, three, four, five in the southern hemisphere. Okay, there's one, one, two, three, four, five, roughly in the northern hemisphere. These are the atmospheric rivers. So here is North America here. So they, with very, very warm equatorial water, these things move to the northeast. Very, very warm Pacific water, they come across into California. Okay, so they're mostly west coast uh, phenomena. So here is one here coming up into Europe. Okay, so these are the so called atmospheric rivers, okay, very clearly seen on this image of total precipitable water. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the papers um, on atmospheric rivers. So I'll talk about this one, uh, proposed algorithm for moisture fluxes from atmospheric rivers. This was, 90, this was from t almost 20 years ago. Um, atmospheric rivers driving flood damages in the western U.S. This, more, this very recent paper. Increasing precipitation volatility. That's from mega drought to mega flood to mega drought in California. The arc, so-called arc storm scenario. Atmospheric river K. K is a thousand. We thought it was a thousand year event. Arc storm scenario. A modeled scenario of what would happen to California a video on arc storm and some arc storm health implications. So, so that's basically what I'm doing in this video series. I'll need more than one video to, to cover this. Okay, so this is uh, some of the uh, early research on a proposed algorithm for moisture fluxes from atmospheric rivers. Okay, so they studied water vapor fluxes in the troposphere. They looked at wind and moisture data from the ECM RWF, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, ECMWF. And basically the water fluxes were divided into filamentary structures known as tropospheric rivers or more commonly atmospheric rivers now and what are termed here broad fields. Okay, tropospheric rivers, those filaments that I showed you in the previous um, GIF or movie, they may carry essentially the total meridional transport observed in the extratropical atmosphere, but they occupy only about 10% of the total longitudinal length. So they're filaments. They're very narrow, very long filaments that carry huge amounts of water vapor uh, up from the tropics to the northeast um, to, to higher latitudes. Okay, so there's a bit of math here. Um, basically, some of the parameters, and, and uh, there's a great book, um, Pio, Pioto and Ort, 1992, The Physics of Climate, classic book. Um, I read it a few years ago. I should dig it out again. Um, but anyway, there's different parameters like Q is specific humidity. U is the zonal wind component, the component from west to east. West to east being positive, east to west being negative by convention. And then meridional wind components are V, positive being uh, from, from, uh, to, uh, from, from the equator north, negative being down towards the equator. 
Okay, longitude lambda is commonly used, latitude phi, Greek phi. Okay, and there's a set of equations which, uh, which allow you to look at the various things. And I'm not going to get into the math. Um, I can if you want. Uh, this is the uh, broad field sort of. Um, this is sort of, uh, okay, there's lots of, this is average values of the mean moisture transport. Um, and, uh, okay, average values of the transient eddy moisture transport. So it's moisture transport, lots of little arrows and stuff. But I don't need to get into these details because just go back and have a look at, uh, you know, this to get an idea of how the transport is occurring. Um, and then the uh, out of the math pops these type of scenarios. So, so this is the moisture flux in kilograms per meter per second by atmospheric rivers. Okay, and then the broad flux. So, so the two different components, broad movements of the water vapor here. But here is the atmospheric rivers that you see. You know, this concentration here concentration here, concentration here, concentration here and here. So five in the northern hemisphere and and one, uh, two, three, four, five, maybe six in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so these are the atmospheric rivers, these filaments. Uh, they can go thousands of miles and they're very narrow. And, uh, you know, this when this one actually comes into the U.S., we get the you know, California being hit by these atmospheric rivers. There's lots of other images here. Um, and I'm not, you can have a look at the paper. There's statistics and stuff for where the rivers occur, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you get the point. Like I say, this is a key image. You can clearly see, you know, the water vapor doesn't spread to higher latitudes in, uh, at, all, at, at all longitudes. It's in these very narrow, uh, wispy, filamentaceous, if you like, uh, areas called atmospheric rivers. Now, this is a very interesting paper, highly recommended. You can just Google the title and find it. Atmospheric rivers drive flood damages in the western United States. So atmospheric rivers are extratropical storms that produce extreme precipitation on the west coast of the world's major land masses. In the U.S., they cause significant flooding, yet their economic impacts have not been quantified that well. So they use 40 years of data in this paper from the National Flood Insurance Program, and they showed that atmospheric rivers are the primary drivers of flood damages in the western U.S. So they developed a scale, an atmospheric river scale. So there's category, just like in hurricanes, category one atmospheric river, category five atmospheric river, the flood damages increase exponentially with the atmospheric river intensity, how long it la or, or how strong it is, and the duration, how long it lasts. Each increase in category from one to five corresponds to a roughly tenfold increase in damages. So it's similar, it's set up along the lines of the categories for hurricanes, which go by damage. Category four and five atmospheric rivers cause damage in the tens for category four and hundreds of millions of dollars for category five. Of course, rising population, more development and climate change are expected to worsen the risk of atmospheric river driven flood damage in future decades. So they're temporarily ephemeral filamentary features in the lower troposphere that horizontally transport large quantities of water vapor on average more than double the flow of the Amazon River up to 25 times the flow and can cause extreme precipitation events on west coast of major land masses due to orographic lift over mountainous topography. Okay, and they were early early, the, the early characterization was the 1998 paper, which I've already shown you. Okay, um, so let's have a look at some of the image. So here, January 4th, 1995, a very powerful atmospheric river off the coast of California. This is precipitable water in kilograms per square meter, and you can see, you know, 35 kilograms per square meter. And so this is, uh, this can be thousands of miles long, okay, not that wide, carry and carry vast amounts of water. So this basically is an atmospheric river that came ashore in California in 1995, causing huge damages. So I'm going to continue in another video. Thank you for listening and 
please go to paulbeckwith.net and consider donating to support my work. Thanks again.